Welcome to the Law School Strategy Podcast, your weekly home for tips, advice, exclusive interviews, and other insights into landing that coveted legal job by graduation. We're here to help every law student develop their law school strategy. Don't go through law school blind. It's time to get out of the classroom, put your books down, and finish that outline later. Now, here's your host, Franklin Graves. This week, I'm excited to talk with Dan Lear from Avo. If you're not familiar with Avo, it's a pretty well-known directory of attorneys that a lot of people are familiar with, especially non-attorneys. Um, so if you haven't graduated from law school yet and gotten your bar license, you will soon learn um, what Avo is and all about that industry. So I'm excited to talk with with Dan from Avo and, and learn more about what he is up to and how he graduated from law school with his job, but that'll come later. So first, I would like to kind of talk through um, a recent question that I had somebody ask me, and it related to accepting a job offer, but continuing to look for another job in the process. So your reputation in the legal industry is extremely important, and I mean beyond more important than anything you could imagine. That's why you need to evaluate your actions or inactions um, with that frame of mind. The person just graduated from law school, so congratulations, uh, and they have a job offer on the table from a law firm, but it's not their ideal job, and it's not their ideal location geographically either. So this, this law school graduate is in a position that most other law students and recent grads probably dream of landing in either May or December um, graduation months. So they, they're, they're already in a great situation, and I think that they should just, first of all, accept that and love that position. However, I think we can all understand, if you're not in your dream job yet and it's not your dream offer, then then you're going to have some hesitations. And I think this is a perfectly normal question, a nor- normal place to be. They're continuing to talk with other firms in an area that they're more interested being and um, within a practice area that they're more passionate about. They continue on to ask about any consequences of first, accepting the offer while continuing to look for other jobs, and then second, accepting the job offer and then piecing out and accepting another potentially better job offer. Now, if you're a regular viewer of my channel, you'll recall I have had some other interviews with lawyers that found themselves facing a revoked job offer or a law firm that didn't even exist after they wrapped up the bar exam. So to address the first part of their question, I think this um, honestly has the right mindset. You shouldn't just stop searching for a job just because you have an offer. You should keep searching or going through with other scheduled interviews up until the day you actually start as an employee. Uh, Typically, nothing prevents a revocation of a job offer unless otherwise stated in the offer. Um, So to answer the second part of their question, we've all been to law school, Um, we've taken contracts, you know the answer, I would think. Um, Unless someone signs or creates a contract, anyone is typically able to accept a job offer uh, and and then decline and not work whenever they wish. Uh, If someone signs a contract, then without giving any legal advice, that, that obviously may have other terms involved limiting their options in this situation. But just accepting an offer via email uh, that has no additional stipulations aside from being an offer with a salary amount uh, or a form letter, I, I can't really see any harm. But again, every situation's different and there might be some, some, some aspects of contract law in your specific jurisdiction that you might want to be aware of. But I can't see any issue with just saying no, um, I'm moving on. Now, all of what I've said comes with a huge caveat. It's very important to keep in mind any damage that could happen to your reputation for accepting and then turning down an offer. If it's a small enough firm and it isn't connected to where you're ideally going to be practice, uh, practicing geographically or in the same practice area, perhaps you will never have an issue or run into the lawyers or staff at the firm. Uh, it honestly depends upon the clo- how close this current opportunity is to someone's final desired location. If you plan on practicing anywhere near where this current job offer is coming from, it may not be worth pulling out just from a professional standpoint. Honestly, I don't think it's the end of the world, but it could be something that is talked about within the legal community if it's small enough. 
I doubt anyone would find out immediately. It's not like the person you accept um, and then decline an offer from would have a secret candidate directly directory they, they could update and all of their employers would see it. Um, I know of nothing of the sort that exists, at least. However, if, if it's in the same practice area, there could be a list serve, which I would say is a worst case scenario, um, but also is really dumb if someone talks openly about another attorney on there. Um, or there could just be a monthly networking or social event that they attend and people talk at. You never know if people are friends, so keep that in mind. Another point to note is that it's very common during the first few years of a young lawyer's career to change firms or jobs. It's understood that other opportunities might become available or you might find yourself in, your, in a practice area that you don't enjoy. It's just important to remember that too many small stints here and there um, can start to cause more problems than you want when someone is looking at your resume. Are you switching around so much because you don't get along with people? Maybe there is something wrong with you that a future employer would be best to avoid. Uh, just don't always assume that the grass is greener on the other side and you need to switch the jobs. You need to switch jobs immediately. Find ways to build your areas of interest or practice within your current setting whenever possible. If you're struggling with this issue, perhaps uh, discuss with your career service office if you feel comfortable with them. Also, I'm happy to answer any questions or discuss further, so just drop them in the comments below. You can also use the comments um, below to share your thoughts or opinions, but this is if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening to the podcast, tweet at me, um, email me, get on the show notes on the website and leave a comment. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, so now I'm gonna kick it over to my interview with Dan Lear. This time on how I graduated from law school with a job, I'm excited to talk with Dan Lear from Seattle, Washington. Hey, Dan. Hey, how are you, Franklin? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining. I'm excited to hear about your journey through law school and then what you've been up to afterwards. I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of listeners and watchers are familiar with your name and your companies that you're involved with. But let's kind of start back at the very beginning. And let me kick it off with the first question of um, why did you go to law school? Um, and then what were you doing before you went to law school? Sure. So I, I frequently joke about the answer to this question, uh, why I went to law school. Um, the, the joke I make is uh, that in my family, you weren't sort of a viable fetus until you had your JD. Um, both of my parents are attorneys. Uh, my grandfather was an attorney. My parents each have one brother. They're both attorneys. My brother's an attorney. His wife's an attorney. Uh, so it runs, my wife is not very thankfully, which is probably why she's the most popular one in the family. Um, but it was, it was, it was kind of, I mean, and I'm the oldest of, of three. And so uh, again, I think it, stereotypically at least the oldest always does sort of, you know, the, the weight of the parents' expectations are particularly heavy on the oldest. Um, so for me, there, there never really was any other path. So for me, I, honestly, and, and this is both a good and a bad thing, I never really thought about doing anything else. And, and this will probably come up as we talk about kind of what the path my career has taken me. Um, but my parents really, particularly my father, but my parents in general really sort of pushed it. The interesting thing about my parents, and again, this probably is a bit of a kind of, um, of a spoiler alert for what's going to come later. Uh, neither of my parents have had very traditional uh, law uh, careers. Um, they both actually are now, well, my mom is a practicing attorney and my dad is the managing partner of a medium sized firm in Salt Lake city, Utah, where I'm from. But that was totally an accident. Um, he has spent most of his time. He's done a variety of things, um, in real estate development, in, uh, environmental consulting, um, in, he actually worked kind of in adjacent to the entertainment industry for a while. And I always think it's kind of funny that he pushed us so hard to be uh, to go to law school, and then actually, his he's kind of the poster child for the for the alternative career before that was really a thing. Um, but I, I would, you know, that's that's the, that's the long sort of um, joke. I, I do think, and 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 this is really what animates me today about both what I do, um, and and what kind of um, why I'm excited about what I do. I do think that lawyers, and I do think the legal system plays a very central role, a really interesting role in our society. I think of it, 
and I've heard other people's people say it this way as well. It's um, it's kind of the, the the framework or the 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 superstructure for the way our society works, um, and so the power to manipulate those rules, the the really just the power and the the kind of insights that you get from being a lawyer and seeing kind of how the pieces that hold society together, sometimes which are invisible or covered, right, to most people, seeing how they work and seeing how they really drive incentives and the way that people do things and why they make the choices that they do, that's a really powerful and interesting place to be. And that's really what gets me passionate again about what I do today is thinking about the legal system as a whole, thinking about how it works, thinking about how we can make it work better. Um, but that's, so did you do, that's, did you, that's what motivated me going in. Did you do anything before law school? Like what, what did you do in undergrad to help prepare you for the law school route? <laughs> I not, not much. Again, that was, again, kind of true to form. Um, even, even though I knew I was probably going to law school, I tended to choose, I chose, I ended up choosing, and I, in retrospect, I probably would have even chosen something, uh, less helpful. Uh, <laughs> um, I did international studies. Um, and really the, the biggest reason I chose that is that it gave me a sample of everything. Uh, I took an e I took econ classes. I took geography classes. I took sociology classes. I took, um, political science classes. Um, and so I, I, I really see at the time, and I can't even really remember now, I'd have to think back, but, um, I was just interested in exposure to a, a broad set of disciplines and a broad way or different ways of, um, kind of viewing the world. The one thing that the, the one thing I did do to my credit is I, I did take a, what I thought was a pretty good LSAT prep course, um, which just like. Just like to a large degree, everything you need to know about being a practicing attorney, you learn in the bar association prep courses. Uh, <laughs> I think everything you really need to know about sort of getting into law school, you can probably pick up in an LSAT prep course. But um, yeah, that's that's kind of how I prepared. If that's even a, if that's even pre prepared in the loosest sense of the term. And so, so where did you go to law school? Where did you end up um, applying and getting into? Uh, so I'll give you a little more backstory there. My wife and I after, so again, I grew up in Utah. That's where my, my wife and I met. That's where I did my undergrad. And then we, once, once we finished school, we sort of wanted to have one of those early twenties adventures. And so my wife was from Portland, Oregon. And so we just decided, Hey, Seattle kind of looks like an interesting place. It was kind of close to her, still somewhat close to my family, but a coastal city, a bigger city, a little more cosmopolitan. Um, so, so we came to Seattle with fully with the expectation that ultimately I'd go to law school. So we, we weren't sure how long we'd stay here. I had hoped actually to get into the University of Washington Law School. That didn't happen, but I'll 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 jump to that in a moment. Um, and ended up just working here for a year. And what I did in that interim year, actually, I worked in the um, in a file room in the records department at uh, a large firm, uh, Perkins Coie, uh, that is based here in Seattle. Um, worked in the personal planning, estate planning department while I was kind of taking my LSAT and doing all my applications. Uh, when I applied, so at the time, and you, you had said that you may ask about my JD MBA, and so this may be a good segue to that, but at the time, I actually thought that I was going to do sort of a JD master's in international studies. Um, kind of, I liked that enough to want to continue with that. Um, and so at the time, I focused most of my applications on programs where I could have done that. So, um, and my LSAT was like, I think I was in the 80th percentile. So, um, you know, good, but not like amazing. Um, I can't remember if it was 80 eight or 8-9. Uh, the funny thing is, kind of flash throwback to the to the days of the early internet when I I actually had to call first to get my LSAT score because they didn't yeah. release it online and this is 2003 but it was still like you know um and and the the ro the robo voice said 80 and it was like I couldn't tell whether it said 80th or 89th and I still like that's the piece I still can't remember but anyway it was like it was like good but not great and I applied to Seattle U, um, thinking like, hey, this is a good option if we want to stay here in Seattle. 
Um, ultimately, I, I did get into American. I got waitlisted at George Washington. I got into BC. I got wait, waitlisted at BU. I got into the University of Utah. I got declined, I think, from Georgetown. Yeah, I know I got declined from Georgetown. I think I got declined from U Chicago. And then the U Dub, like they, they pushed me out, pushed me out, pushed me out, pushed me out. Finally, they they told me no. Um, the University of Washington. Um, and ultimately, uh, uh, Seattle U offered what what at the time was a pretty compelling scholarship offer. Um, and we were like, hey, we like Seattle. Um, why not make this our home at least for the next few years? And so that's where I, that's where I ended up. Um, that's how I ended up doing, doing Seattle U. And then if I, yeah, I don't know if you want to go there, but I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, so when did, when did the NBA pick up on the play? NBA piece there. Did you have to uh, apply separately to follow. an NBA program? Yeah. So, so, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, in the theme of doing the JD masters in international studies, um, you know, I ended up going to a school that didn't have that. But I knew, I always knew that I wanted, again, almost hearkening back to that undergrad piece, I wanted, I wanted another lens through which to see the world. Um, and I had actually just heard from a couple, actually it was, it was a woman who was an associate attorney at the firm when I worked there. Um, she had said she, she'd done the JD MBA program and, and spoke highly of it. And so I was like, oh, okay, I think I'll give that a try. And then a professor that I really liked, my contracts professor, was one of the law professors who had helped set up the program. And I, I really liked her and she thought spoke highly of it. So that was how I ended up doing the MBA. Um, I did, yes, I did have to apply separately, but it was an established program. Um, and so I applied, I think, I can't remember my first year or right after my first year. Um, Seattle U, great school, you know, love it, but like not super competitive. Um, and I think having a, um, a leg up, having been already admitted to the law school, they were like, why, yes, Mr. Lear, we'll take more of your money. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, so I think I applied like that, that spring, either right after I finished my first year exams or as I was finishing them. So is a, is a dual program like that something you would recommend for law students that are kind of on the fence of, of maybe considering doing a joint MBA program? Do you, did you find it beneficial even now after mm -hmm. law school? That is a, and again, you've already noticed Franklin that this guy can talk. <laughs> um, that is a very interesting question. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, the short answer as it relates to JD MBAs is um, there are very few jobs where someone's like, you know who I need for this job? Also, I'm just as a total aside, I'm noticing that you and I have almost matching shirts today. Oh, yeah, we want the um, blue checkered plaid. But, but, yeah, yeah. Well done, my friend. <laughs> But, but, you know, there are so few employers who are like, you know who I need for this job? A JD MBA. Um, <laughs> I think the SEC sometimes hires them. Um, and, and even at top schools, um, you're, you're either trading off of one or the other. Um, it's, it's just the two. And, and I like to give lawyers more credit than this. Uh, you know, frequently one of the things I say in my job is, Lawyers don't have very strong business skills. Um, I, I do like to believe, though, I mean, so, so there's, there's a world in which you could say, like, business thinking and legal thinking are almost diametrically opposed. I don't think that's 100% true, but it is true that, like, in business, you're supposed to seek opportunities. You're supposed to take risks, calculated risks, but risks. You need to be comfortable with risk. You need to understand it. Whereas, to a large degree, a lot of lawyers you're trained to eradicate risk. You're trained to eliminate risk. You're trained to spot and identify and even exacerbate to some extent risk, or at least exacerbate the possibility of risk. Absolutely. So they're very, um, they're, 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 they're kind of opposed. Um, so all that's to say, that, yeah, well, and, 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 and I'm, I'll, I guess we can talk more about my career in a moment. I have really enjoyed uh, having both skill sets. Uh, I think it serves me very well in my current role. I, th I hope that it will serve me well down the road. Um, would I recommend it for, well, and, and I'll, I think there's the whole question of would I recommend joint programs in general, which maybe I'll step away uh, from that for a moment. 
Um, it, you know, that's a, it's a really challenging question because the cost of higher education is so high today. Um, I, I worked through a good chunk of law school, so I, was manage, I managed to keep my debt down a little bit. Um, I, I, and so it's really, it's really a, a tricky question. I guess I would say, I, I, and this is, the, this is the advice I give to all law students, um, which is just be prepared to hustle. Like that, that is the biggest thing. Like, you know, not only do you have to hustle if you just want any job, um, but if you really want to end up in a place where you want to be, if you, if you want to end up in a place that like really utilizes your skills and enables you to grow and develop, you're, you're going to have to hustle. And so I would say if you're going to do a, 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 a JD MBA program or really any kind of joint program, say is, and I think these days are gone, but when I went to law school, I think people sort of viewed loans as like free money. It was like, well, why shouldn't I get another degree? Like, you know, it'll pay it someone. It'll pay itself yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's somebody there ready to hand me $75,000 to pay for this. Like, why shouldn't I? And I, I think a lot of law students are more ROI conscious as they should be than they used to be. So the first thing I'd say is be aware that you're not like, this, this is not free money. It's not coming, you know, out of, it's, you know, it's going to come, you're going to have to pay it off. It's going to come from somewhere at some point. So that's, that's point one. And then point two is if you do pursue it and, you know, again, I think there's a world in which, well, understand that to a large degree, you're probably pursuing it for the long term and not for the short term. Um, so I guess that's point two. And then point three would be, be prepared to hustle. Understand that, it's really probably not going to give you a significant leg up at least out of the gate. And so you're going to have to hustle just like everyone else. And really you're going to have to hustle just as, as if you didn't have a, a, a joint degree um, to find a job and to find a job that, that you really want. Exactly. And I think that's a really good distinction. You have some really good points there that, I definitely think law students and future law students should be considering when they decide to take on, as you said, even the extra debt alone. Um, so let's kind of let's kind of switch gears here and talk about your life during law school. What internships did you take part in? What school activities did you just go to class? What what was that like for you during law school? Yeah. So uh, I, um, how did I? What did I do? So. Uh, first year I was super, I, I was quite heads down, um, a little bit now. Um, I wish I had taken the opportunity to just, you know, I, I realized pretty quickly on, I should have realized really early on that I was not going to be a star law school student <laughs> where my strengths lied. And I wish I hadn't tried quite so hard. I, you know, I, I, I guess just a quick, quick aside, um, I feel like to a large degree, students should view their time in education, particularly higher education as a, a laboratory. And, you know, like it's important to, to do well in your studies, but like that's an opportunity where you're surrounded by an institution that has a significant amount of resources um, and really by really smart people who are also trying to find their way in the world. Undergrad and law school, I wish I had, I wish I'd just tried a bunch more stuff. I wish I'd kind of gotten my hands dirty in a bunch of different opportunities. And so first year I spent a lot of time doing that. I did do two things my first year, again, sort of in this spirit of getting my hands dirty that I'm at least I think sort of set the stage for what I would do. Um, the first was I actually ran for um, student body president um, and my, my campaign platform, much like my current role was like, this whole system is messed up and we have to do something different and we should do something different. Um, I did not win. I didn't even get into the, to the, um, <laughs> to the uh, final election, the general election. Um, but, but people, it, it resonated with people. Um, and I think that was in, in an interesting way, even though I took a, a much more securitist path after law school to where I ended up. I think that was a first thing that I, sort of realized that, hey, I could be onto something. And then the other thing I did was I organized, I was, a, I, again, because of the international bent, um, 
I, uh, I worked with the International Law Society to organize um, a mini World Cup. And so we got, um, we had, pe- we had teams uh, of like five or six that all represented countries. Um, and we had a little indoor soccer field in our um, local, in the gymnasium at the school. Um, and uh, so I, I, or I, what I did is I raised money. Each team paid an entrance fee of like $50. Um, and I bought pizza for everybody. And then I actually went to like the Goodwill and bought a little trophy, um, or not a a little trophy, a big trophy that the winners could have. Um, and, uh, and so we had this world cup and it it actually ended up being like quite successful and really fun. Um, so that was my first year. And then, uh, but then what happened actually the, the, the summer of, so by the summer of my, after my first year, that was when I applied to business school. Um, I actually, I, I ended up um, getting a, a law clerk job actually for my landlord who happened to be an attorney. Um, he did, he had kind of a consumer protection general practice, um, did some work for him. But a few things happened that summer. Uh, my, my spouse got pregnant. So we, we were going to have a kid. Um, I got into the business school and at Seattle U, um, all of the business classes were at night. Um, and I got offered a job to go out and work in the legal department, uh, at Microsoft. Um, how did you, so I thought, (laughs) yeah, so that was, it was a crazy few years. So the JD MBA program was four years, um, in kind of designed to be four years. Uh, I ended up, it ended up taking me four and a half, four and three quarters, um, to get all the way through, um, But I, and and actually the Microsoft gig, I thought, you know, I'll just do this for, or or I I could, you know, I could only do it, if I wanted, I could just do it for a year while all of my, because the way that the JD MBA program worked is it was one full year of law school, school, and then two years combined. And so I figured uh, I'll just, I could, I could just do this for a year if I want, and then um, go back and, you know, just quit and go back and finish out if I, if I needed to. But I ended up, again, we, we started a family. Benefits became really important. Uh, I, I frankly think that I functioned better having had some work experience um, and kind of having seen the way that the law actually worked in, in real life. Um, I actually got a small scholarship from Microsoft, so they helped to pay, pay down my debt. That helped keep my debt lower. Just working right through law school, it meant that I wasn't just taking out loans to live and to um, go to school. Um, and so I ended up working the last three and a half years of law school, um, which I, for me, I think was, was a great call. I, my grades suffered, um, but ultimately, again, since I had already concluded that I wasn't going to be, <laughs> wasn't going to be winning any uh, jobs as a result of my grades, um i was i was okay with that so, so somebody said there's only there are 90 percent of the people are not in the top 10 percent of the class and i think that that's just something that's resonated with me and i've kept saying over and over since then so i think that's perfectly valuable information to know that like for when people are honest and share the fact that they weren't at the top of the class <laughs> yeah and one thing i did do and again this has been a nice recurring theme for me we had a you had the possibility to write on to law review um, and I, I did enjoy writing. I do enjoy writing. It's still a part of what I do today. And I did write on to law review. So for what it's worth, I got, you know, I checked that box and, and really enjoyed being on law review actually. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, you know, again, I, I think for, I, I, I go back to this notion of hustle. Uh, I, I think notion of this idea of just having to hustle, it's going to inform really your entire career. Um, and so if you want to be that great straight A student, that's awesome. But do recognize that so much of particular, I mean, I really, if you go to any law school and particularly if you want to really have an impact on the world and do fun, interesting, meaningful work, um, you're going to have to sort of hustle to find, uh, find that opportunity. It's not going to, not going to just present itself to you. 
Exactly. It's just a different type of hustle. It's a hustle during focusing on academics and that is your hustle. You're not actually doing outside of the classroom hustling for career advancement, professional development. And I think, yeah. Well, and I guess I guess I would actually I'd even quibble with that a bit just to say that, um, yes, that is a, t a type of hustle. But I think you need to have that other kind of hustle as well. Um, I, yeah. I, I just I don't believe that. Um, I, well, to, I mean, and again, you, you might not want to go there, but I, to a large degree, I'm just not even sure that what they teach in law school actually accurately represents the skills that you need to be a successful attorney, very narrow skill set. It, it, and it focuses on a super, super narrow skill set. So even if you are doing very well in law school, un, even if you, you know, and, and that's where you're devoting all your hustle, totally fine. But at least have the awareness to know that like, and a, a, a straight A law student does not a partner make. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so to get it sidetracked further, let's go ahead and get to the question, and I'll finally ask the question that everybody wants to know. Did you graduate from law school sure. with a job? And if so, how did you do it? I think we've kind of touched on the how a little bit, but I'll let you describe that a little bit more and tell us what that it was. Sure. I did. I, well, I, was, I remained employed at Microsoft. I was working as a paralegal. Um, and so I did have that job. Um, that was not the job I wanted. Um, but it, but it was and what year, a job. I think we need to set the tone. What year was it that you graduated from sure. law school? I think that's really important to know. Um, I graduated in December of 2007. Perfect timing for the job market. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. I, 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 things started to fall apart really in the next six months. Um, what happened to me was I, uh, I was lucky enough to land a job. So I, I, in April of 08, I was lucky enough to land a job with a small firm um, who was basically had been our, who'd, who'd done outside counsel work for the Microsoft department that I'd been working with. Um, and so ultimately I was able to segue into a job. Um, it ended up being a job, at least economically and title wise that aligned with my kind of, desires um professionally personally uh it was really a struggle for me i i i don't again as is probably abundantly clear from our conversation already uh the writing was on the wall that i was probably not going to be kind of a crackerjack lawyer or at least that's not where my um my passion lied um, or lay, I don't know how you say that again, I guess it's not grammar either, but that's another discussion. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so I, I, but I did, I did, I would say that I would say I almost, I, I basically did graduate with the job or at least my role at Microsoft enabled me to have a path that was pretty clear and direct to a job. Um, and I think that the job that I had when you graduated is one that many law students are extremely envious and would, would bend over backwards to have even, even the title paralegal, although that's not necessarily what, what people go to law school to have that title. I think that's, that's a great company. The work you're probably involved on or involved in is unparalleled to a degree. So I think that that, that certainly qualifies to say that you had a job after law school. So can you, can you walk me through the, the process? You kind of mentioned it. you went with a firm after that and, and kind of walk me through the next steps of your career and what that looked like professionally. Yeah. And let me, I'll, I'll just say one thing too about that. You know, when I was at micro, you're exactly right. And, and I was working on really interesting stuff and my crank the way I was approaching it, but I just, the legal piece was, was less interesting to me, but you're exactly right. And, 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 and I guess I, there's two pieces there that I would relevant for, for young, young lawyers or folks who are trying to make their way. The first thing is that on the one hand, you are totally right. I did have a great opportunity, but at my core, I didn't, I didn't appreciate it. I didn't like it. It was what, it, it wasn't what I wanted. And I actually really wrestled internally with that because I'm like, I should be grateful for this, but I'm not because it just didn't, it, like it didn't sit well with kind of what I wanted to do and where I wanted to take my career. Yeah. Um, 
The next piece was I actually lobbied really hard. I worked pretty hard internally to see if there was a path for me to become an attorney at Microsoft without mm. having to leave. Um, and the interesting thing about that was, um, and I've, I've had this discussion with some, some law students and some young lawyers, what I ultimately, so, and I was unsuccessful in that endeavor, even though I knew there were some people who had done it, I, I felt like I made a very compelling case. But what I realized, and again, I think this is so key, and I hear a lot of law students talking about this, really want to plant this seed because I think it's so important. What I realized is, ultimately, I didn't really even want to be an attorney. Um, and so the reason that I was pushing the folks at Microsoft to make me as an attorney, make me an attorney, is because I saw it as a stepping stone to something else. Mm. And 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 really, the the it, it wasn't really the most direct path to where I wanted to go. Um, I'll, I'll I'll say something and then I'll I'll qualify it a little bit, but the great thing that many law students, young lawyers have when they graduate or even as they're beginning to graduate is, yeah, you've got that debt load and that's something, and again, like I'm sensitive to that. I don't want to dismiss that. I don't want to make it, but um, this is your time to experiment. This is your time to like figure out what you want. You know, it, you can, you can live for, you've been living cheap for a while. I know you're like, finally, now I'm, I'm out of school. I don't want to live cheap, but like your overhead, again, I had a family, so I had some more obligations, but still like your overhead is low. The expectations are low. The opportunity where you should really try to, and frankly, you should spend time in law school figuring out like, what do I want? Where do I want to go? Um, and so like this, this pathway that I took where I was like pushing and pushing and pushing internally to, to go be an attorney, uh, it really wasn't what I wanted. And, and so in some ways, I think in some ways, I think that's why it didn't work out, because I think the people, even though I was saying all the right words, they're like, but we can tell it isn't really what you want. Um, but I hear so many law students say, oh, you know, I'm going to go practice for a year or a few years and then I'm going to go figure out what I want. Or, oh, you know, I've got to take this job because it's in front of me and it's a good one. I, I appreciate that. But like, tr please spend the time to be intentional. Please spend the time to be direct. Please spend the time to be thoughtful about where you want to go. Cause, cause a, like you'll, you'll go down this path and you'll end up, I'm sure you've heard of the golden handcuffs, right? Where you're making yeah. a lot of money and you're totally miserable and, and making that transition is much more costly five or 10 years down the road than yeah. it is when you're, you're younger. Um, the, the second is, um, I mean, I hear, I hear from, from kind of young lawyers all the time. Like I, I heard this from a lawyer in, in New York who, who like, um, she didn't, you know, she, she graduated from Brooklyn law school, like not the greatest law school, but she did well and ended up at like a big firm. And she was like trying to get out of it. And she's like, well, what are my skills? Like, I don't, I don't have anything else to do. I don't, I, I don't know how to do anything else. And like, on one hand, that's ridiculous. Like, holy crap, you went to like, a, <laughs> a, you know, you went to a top 20 law firm. You're clearly a competent person. Um, but you didn't really spend that time to like figure out where you wanted to go and what you wanted to do. Don't, don't, don't just like, just take something um, because you sort of, you know, it's there or it makes sense or it's what everyone else thinks you should do. Um, spend that time to be direct. Now, all that being said, I will say there's also this notion that I like to call tacking. Uh, and if you're familiar with sailing, right, when you're sailing into the wind, um, you actually can't go in a straight line. You have to go in, in – and you can sail into the wind, but you have, to, you have to what's called tack. You have to make diagonal kind of movements. And so it's totally okay to tack. It's okay to take that job if you're conscious of like, Hey, this is the next step, but like, but, but really be honest with yourself because there's so many miserable lawyers out there. Um, job out of law school and either because of finance or be finances or because really they don't know or believe that they know how to do anything else. They're, they're stuck doing something that they hate um, when they could really be making a, a bigger difference 
um, and probably making about the same amount of money or even, you know, they'd even say like, hey, I'd make a third less if I knew I could be home and spend time with my family or have time for my hobbies or feel fulfilled or have that other aspect of my professional life that's not fulfilled. So anyway, that was, that was two big asides, but like don't get hung up on that guilt and really be specific about what you want. Um, and then your next question was, okay, so, so what happened after I graduated and how did I get to where I am? Right? Exactly. <laughs> okay. And I'll, I'll make that, I'll, 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 I'll make that shorter and not get on my soapbox. So very briefly took a job with this firm, found out pretty quickly. I didn't, didn't really enjoy what I was doing. Um, well, breadwinner, my wife was, we, we, we subsequently had another kid the summer before I graduated from law school. And then we had a third one in December of 2010. Um, so she was busy raising, raising our boys. And so, uh, it was a bit of a transition for me, but I, uh, and this goes, this gets back to this, you know, this notion of sort of my family dynamic. Um, I had had sort of blinders on. Uh, about being a lawyer for so long that when I sort of had pr been practicing for a year or 18 months and it was becoming abundantly clear both to me and to my firm, frankly, that it wasn't a good fit, I had spent absolutely no time. What do I want to do? What do I do well? Where do I want to go? Um, and so I very slowly began that process. Um, this was, again, I went to this CLE, sort of choose your your career, kind of this career direction CLE. Late 2009, maybe early 2010, probably. Um, and, and like sort of began that process in a very minimal way. But, um, and again, I'm happy to go into the details, but I basically just spent a ton of time figuring out like, wow, what do I like doing? What do I want to do? What do I do well? And how can I begin to make that a career? Because uh, for me, and again, like maybe maybe you can just say that I'm one of those, and I'm not a millennial. I'm I'm an I'm either a young millennial and I'm an old Gen Xer, but or I mean, <laughs> I'm either a young Gen Xer or, or an old millennial, depending on how you count it. But um, I was like I, I I just I could not, you know, I, I met at one point with this partner, at this law firm, a big firm here in Seattle, really nice guy, kind of even in a way been a bit of a mentor to me. And he said, you know, I, I started practicing at this firm and I, I worked here for three or four years. And I, he's like, I sat back one, I sat back one day and I said, I could see myself doing that for the rest this for the rest of my life. Thinking in the moment, like, oh my gosh, I would kill myself. <laughs> but I sort of started thinking like, okay, so what do I want to spend my life doing? Um, and so there was this evolution of that and, and very briefly, what happened with me was I realized at least two things that I liked doing and I did relatively well was I liked writing and I actually liked public speaking. I liked being in front of people and organizing people. Um, and so I basically, and again, this is, we can talk career tips if you want, but I basically just started doing those things. Uh, I was working, but I was finding time on the side to kind of do that. Um, and I started writing a bunch about how I thought the legal sector should change and throwing it out and basically talking to anyone who would listen. Um, I simultaneously started a meetup group along these topics. So I was like, let's see if we can get a bunch of people in the room who are passionate about law and technology and about innovating in the practice of law. Um, and, I, and I started a group in Seattle to do that. And it, it succeeded my expectations. <laughs> And kind of one thing led to another. And this, again, I said I started this process in about 2010. Uh, in about mid-2013, um, I said, okay, I've, I'm kind of starting to feel some momentum behind this stuff that I'm doing. I gave myself a year. And I basically said, like, I'm going to double down on this legal tech stuff. I'm going to double down on this legal innovation stuff. All the while, like, still maintaining my practice. Um, and if, and I'm going to give myself a year and see if I can turn it into anything. Um, and if I can't, then I'm just going to quit my job or I'm going to realize that I've got to leave this firm and can basically, you know, go find a job in house or find something else to keep bread on the table, but not my first choice. But my first choice would be like, can I figure out how to do this legal tech or legal innovation stuff, um, for a living? That makes sense. Um, and, uh, 
and you know, knock on wood, whatever, you know, I, good, good fortune, a bunch of things probably. Uh, Avo happened to be based here in Seattle, got them all along and actually for a variety of reasons, wasn't sure they'd be a good fit for me. Um, but through some of my networking and community activities, I, I got to know the company very impressed. Um, and one thing led to another and, and basically they said, Basically, they said, we see that you're super active in this space. We need someone to do something like what you're doing. Would you like to get paid for it? And I was <laughs> like, uh, where, you know, where do I sign? Um, <laughs> so, so what is Avo for people that aren't familiar with it? Sure. So Avo is a directory that helps connect consumers with lawyers. Um, we have uh, profiles for just about every co- attorney in the country. And we encourage every attorney to come and to join the platform to, to establish their profile and build it out so that more consumers can find them and, and bring them more business. Um, my role here, so when they hired me, uh, the, the, the expectation was that the company was going to grow pretty significantly, which it has. Um, and they needed someone else besides the CEO and besides the general counsel to sort of be out as a liaison, um, talking to bar associations, groups. Um, they also said, Hey, we noticed that you have kind of a brand or some connections that we think might be valuable for us that they wanted to trade off of, um, a reputation that they thought they could leverage. And so that's what, what they've done. So I spend a lot of my time actually doing stuff like this, talking to legal space like you, about who I am, about what Avo is, about um, technology in general. My technical title is Director of Industry Relations, but really what I say is I'm a, um, a legal technology. I do, I do outreach and legal technology evangelism for Avo. So it's been almost 15 years since you started Right Brain Law, and I think that plays right into what you just described, which was setting up yourself as an authority within this sector. And so can you kind of go into detail as to what Right Brain Law is and and how that helped you establish your brand further? So, uh, and I, you know, it's funny, I've I've put 15 years up there, and this is the first time I've actually said this publicly, Uh, (laughs) the, the start date was when I ran for student body president at law school. I had a feeling that's, that that I might really, have been what started it. <laughs> that was where I picked, yeah, that was, and, and then what I, what I did as well when I was on Law Review, the article that I wrote that ultimately wasn't published was on international legal outsourcing, which at the time was uh, a very new and radical idea. And so I, again, I kind of drew, I drew this line between activities I'd been involved with um, that kind of seemed to make make this kind of theme. Um, the name Right Brain Law actually came, was inspired by a book by a, by a guy by the name of Dan Pink, um, who's actually a lawyer. He's, he's written a bunch of business books um, and a lawyer by training, though he never practiced law, um, who wrote a book called A Whole New Mind back in like 2007, 2008. And the premise of the book was that the analytical skills 20th century are necessary but not sufficient for the 21st century, and that the skills uh, of the 21st century are will will be skills that will sort of dictate success in the 21st century. Will be a lot of skills that we um, kind of the right brain. So, um, uh, and I, I'm not going to get them all, but skills like empathy, play design, symphony, story. Um, And so he wrote this book and he talked about all of these areas. And again, this guy is even a lawyer, but but even his examples that he gave of um, lawyers who were kind of living in this space and doing, you know, living this more, you know, kind of applying this principle of sort of, yes, um, analytical, but also kind of more broader skills he gave very few examples and I was like, well, I'll, I'll take up the charge. I want to, I want to be sort of a voice for um, bringing those ideas into law. Um, And so that's really, and so, so that's where the, the, the Twitter handle and the blog name uh, came from. 
Um, and, and yeah, and then the rest is history. That was, I started the, I started the blog, even though again, I, I cheat and say that it all began back in law school. The blog I launched in either 2009 or 2010 action, uh, around 2013, 2012. Okay. Uh, so, Going back to law students and law school, what is something that you, let's, the way I typically phrase this is a hypothetical that you are now about to graduate law school um, in this year, 2017. What advice would you give to yourself? Oh, man. Well, I, I think I've already given it. So this, I, I'll <laughs> be able to keep this, this, this question really brief or the answer relatively brief. I, I think I've already said it. It's, it's three things. And again, well, the first thing I'd say is, Start thinking about graduation before the day of graduation. Um, start thinking about graduation the first minute you're in law school. Absolutely. Um, because uh, you, you cannot, I, I, the, the economy is not what it used to be. And uh, for, for most law students, just being a lawyer isn't going to be sufficient to ensure that you're going to have a successful you need to, you need to, you need to start thinking about those things early. So again, uh, that's a little bit of cheat because you asked me like, if you're graduating now, what would I say? Um, but the other two things are, 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 are the same things I've said already, which is what do you do well? What do you want to do? And be really honest with yourself. Um, and if you take a job to, to, or because it's in front of you and it's too good to pass up, that's fine. But, but, but really spend that time because you're going to, you're going to be happier I ultimately think you'll probably make more money um, or you'll certainly make more money per hour, but your, your lifestyle will be better if you're really focused and, and able to find some place where you, where you function effectively, most effectively, more effectively than other people. And the second thing I'd say, and again, I've already said it is hustle. No job is going to come to you easily, but the job you want is certainly not going to come to you easily. In fact, most of those jobs, people don't even, again, they talk about the hidden job market, but like people don't even, they don't even like my job, my job, I, you know, I, I don't want to give myself too much credit, but I, <laughs> I basically invented it. Um, it didn't exist before they met me. Um, and I think they'd been thinking about hiring someone like me, but I'm not sure that it would have turned out exactly the way that it did if, if not for someone, you know, if, if not I, if I had not come along. Um, and so, um, I, you know, I, that, that, that notion of hustle and whether it's, hey, yeah, I could take this full-time job that's not doing exactly what I want, two part-time or two contract gigs and piece of living together, but directionally is much more consistent with what I want. Um, Get comfortable with that hustle because the other thing I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced of um, is that that hustle is not only going to be beneficial to you as you begin your career now. That is the, one of the defining characteristics of how you're going to be successful in today's economy. Uh, the great news is that you can change careers every three or four years today um, and you can go off and do something different, um, but you have to be comfortable. The bad news is your company may decide to free up your future sooner than you expect. <laughs> um, and, 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 and it goes both ways, right? Like employees are more empowered to be shopping their skills around and changing and making decisions um, from an employee to an employer isn't what it once was. And similarly, the, the loyalty from an employer to an employee isn't what it once was. And so that notion of hustle will serve you not only in this segment of your life, but career. Definitely. Well, thank you so much. And, and one thing I'd like to ask before we close out is what's the best way for somebody to reach out to you if they have any additional questions or just want to connect? What are some, what are some methods of reaching you? Yeah. Twitter is my social media drug of choice. So that's <laughs> probably the best place to catch me is at right brain law. Um, I spend a lot of time on Twitter. Um, probably the best, best place. I've had people hit me up on my Avo profile before and I give them props for that. That's, that's creative. Um, <laughs> I, I, if, if, if you send me a LinkedIn request and you tell me that you heard me on Franklin's podcast or you, you give me something more personal than just, 
hey, I'd like to join your LinkedIn network. I'll generally to, but I get, you get so many spammy requests um, that I, I want something more personal than just, hey, I'd like to join my, my LinkedIn network, your LinkedIn network. But yeah, Twitter would be my first choice. Well, I would hope that anybody listening doesn't do that because I've said time and time again on both this show and other videos I post, that is the worst way to connect with somebody. Always customize and tailor the message before you send it on LinkedIn if you have no connection to them whatsoever. So I would hope that somebody listening doesn't do that. <laughs> and I like LinkedIn, to be clear. There are, there are LinkedIn haters out there. I'm a fan, but like that's yeah. not how you should be using LinkedIn. Yeah. And, 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 and in all fairness, whenever you're on the mobile app, so on um, an iPhone or, or Android phone, when you tap connect, um, yes. you don't have it the option to tailor. It doesn't give you the ability. That's right. But even then, you know that. And so, or whoever's listening. Take the time that, so. to get on your desktop. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Dan. I again, I appreciate you taking the time to talk today and share some really incredible insights and some great stories about your, your career path. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Franklin. Well, that wraps up another episode of Law School Strategy. Remember to hit the subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube or subscribe to your favorite podcast app. Um, it also helps if you leave a rating. Uh, that helps with the iTunes algorithms and the Google Play Store and also on YouTube if you, if you thumbs up or leave a comment below how much you appreciate and enjoy the content. Uh, thank you for listening and I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Law School Strategy Podcast. Check out lawschoolstrategy.com and make sure you subscribe to never miss an episode of the Law School Strategy Podcast. We're on all podcast apps and on YouTube, so leave a review. Connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Remember, nothing in this podcast should be considered legal advice. Please consult with an attorney on any legal issues you may be facing.